Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening to all you friendly, enthusiastic Republicans. Say, isn't this great? Since I couldn't personally get to each district, the Republican National Committee came up with this means of beaming me out to gatherings all over the country. So I'm being bounced off a satellite and then down to your individual gathering. We've come a long way since my days in radio at WHO in Des Moines. But I'll admit, I'm a little worried. The way I'm beaming all over the place, I'm afraid someone might mistake me for Jerry Brown, California's Mr. Medfly. But no matter what the electronic election techniques, politics still depends on people. People at the grassroots, like all of you out there tonight. You make the difference in every election. And you're going to make the difference in this one as well. I'm upbeat about November 2nd because our candidates are good, like the ones we're supporting tonight. And in spite of what you sometimes hear on the news, I believe the issues are on our side. For example, the economy. Rather than running away from the economic issue, I think the real economic record is in our favor if we can just get the truth out. We Republicans are doing a good job cleaning up a mess that built up for decades. And I'm genuinely convinced the American people understand that and will show it on election day. The economic issue that the opposition is trying to bully us with is like the bully himself. Once you stand up to him, he slinks away. Five economic problems, as I said last night, were beating this country over the head when we came to Washington 20 months ago. Runaway spending, double-digit inflation, two years of it back to back for the first time in 60 years, the worst interest rates in 100 years, the highest peacetime tax burden in our history as a nation, and high unemployment. Well, we've made dramatic gains on four of those five problems. The good news Republicans can run on is an inflation rate that reached a peak of 18% in January of 1980, but that has now been cut to 5.1% for the first eight months of this year. The prime interest rate reached 21.5% before we came to office, and has now been knocked down to 12%, and we're not by any means finished with it yet. More good news Republicans can run on is the cut in growth of government spending by nearly two-thirds, 17% a year, down to 6%. And we will have cut tax rates 25% by next July. And last month, auto sales went up by 8.5%. If you want more good news, Look at what the stock and bond markets are doing as confidence returns to Wall Street and Main Street investors from coast to coast. Yes, there are still tough problems, especially that tragic unemployment rate. Sadly, unemployment is always just about the last to feel a recovery. But we're going to beat unemployment just as we're beating the rest of our economic problems. And when we get it licked this time, it's going to stay licked because the recovery will be a real one not an artificial quick fix trumped up by Washington's big spenders. Incidentally, I heard that diatribe that followed my broadcast last night. The dictionary says a demagogue is one who arouses people's emotions for his own benefit or purpose. Well, the demagogue from Michigan held me personally responsible for causing 10.1% of our workforce to be unemployed. But 7.4% of them were unemployed when we got here. By my figures, we're only responsible for 2.7%. But we're trying to help all 10.1% get jobs, which is more than our opponents can say. And we can do it. With the new Republicans, we'll elect this fall. And that's what we're all gathering for tonight. So before I turn this over to questions, I just want to say thank you for working for these fine Republican candidates. They are the kind of conscientious and principled public leaders America needs and I look forward to working with them in the next Congress. Now, as we go to your questions, I'd like to introduce my political director, Ed Rollins, who is going to help me out this evening. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as we go coast to coast, we begin by going to South Bend, Indiana, the home of Notre Dame football, where more than 1,500 folks have gathered to honor our good friend, Jack Heiler. As most of you know, Jack defeated uh, John Bradamus, the Democratic whip, two years ago, and Jack uh, is going to ask us our first question this evening. Come on, Jack. Hello? Ask the question. Mr. President, this is John Hyler from South Bend, Indiana. 
I want to compliment you on a very fine speech last evening. The question I have, Mr. President, is what are the prospects for real peace in the Middle East? Well, Jack, I think the prospects are good. I'm optimistic about the Middle East and what's going on there. Uh, as you know, we've had our good man, Ambassador Habib, over there negotiating again, the man who brought about the ceasefire. And uh, he is assisted by another one, uh, his uh, uh, companion, Ambassador Draper. But what we're trying to do is first help the newly elected president over there with our multinational force establish stability in Lebanon. They've been for several years uh, divided up into factions, each faction with its own militia. But I think progress is being made there. We've heard statements recently that uh, both Israel and Syria have expressed their willingness uh, to leave. Uh, they, I think, would like to do it simultaneously. And so I think progress is being made. And then we've been in contact with the Arab nations as well as with our friends and allies in Israel. And it will take negotiations under the Camp David pattern to bring about a just solution for the Palestinian refugees and at the same time have the other Arab states do what Egypt did first, and that is recognize the right of Israel to exist as a nation and have peace treaties with them. And I think that we have a very good chance of succeeding. Mr. President, we'll move on now to our second, uh, second fundraiser in Denver, Colorado, where many of your friends and supporters, including Holly and Joe Kors and Congressman Guy Vanderjack and Senator Bill Armstrong are there to honor three outstanding candidates, uh, one of whom is, is an incumbent, Ken Kramer, our good friend and supporter, former Apollo astronaut Jack Swigert, who's uh, running in the uh, district out there, and John Beekner, who's challenging Tim Wirth in a tough race in the, in the second, the new second district out there. Our question asker tonight is a RNC Eagle, good supporter of yours, Mr. Cortland Dietler, who's president of Spruce Oil Company, and he'll now ask you a question. Well, Cortland. Uh, Mr. President, what is the best method to assure a mutually verifiable reduction in the weapons of war that will bring more security to the world? Cortland, I believe that we're on the way, if that's possible at all, that we're going to do it now with the policy that we've been following. As you know, we have negotiating teams, negotiating with well, three of them in, in uh, uh, Geneva, Switzerland, one in Vienna, and uh, we're negotiating for a reduction of conventional arms and weapons. But in Switzerland, we are also negotiating two teams, negotiating a reduction, a legitimate reduction in the strategic nuclear weapons. And the other one is negotiating, and we have proposed down to zero the intermediate range nuclear weapons in Europe. Now, the Soviets have 945 warheads aimed at targets in Europe in their medium-range missiles, and we have no deterrent whatsoever, but have promised our allies at their request that we're going to provide the Pershing II missiles as a deterrent force aimed at Russian targets. We have proposed that if they will eliminate their SS-20 weapons, we will refrain from installing those Pershing II missiles of ours in Europe. Now, the reason that I am optimistic is because in years past, we have tried to negotiate arms limitation treaties with the Soviet Union at the same time that as in the previous few years, we were unilaterally disarming. We were canceling the B-1 bomber. We were reducing our forces in strength and so forth. We have embarked on a course of a legitimate buildup to ensure our own national security. And this is what has brought the Soviet to the bargaining table, ready to negotiate. Whether we'll get all we ask, of course, we probably won't. But I think we have a good chance of getting legitimate reduction because now that we are reinstituting our armed forces, the Soviet Union knows they don't want that. I think it was all explained in a cartoon recently. It was Brezhnev talking to a Russian general. And he was saying, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. Now, we'll be ready to reduce instead of build up when they agree with us that they will reduce down to equal terms with us. 
Mr. President, we move next to Michigan, the home of that demigod that you uh, mentioned earlier in your speech, who the good citizens there are going to retire. Tonight they're there honoring Congressman Jim Dunn and our outstanding candidate Dick Milliman. As you know, Congressman Jim Dunn is uh, in a rematch with uh, Bob Carr, who he defeated and retired and will keep retired. And Dick Milliman is one of our outstanding uh, candidates who's challenging uh, Howard uh, Wolpe there. Well, Dick, Dick Jim. Is, Dick is going to ask the question, Mr. President. Good evening, Mr. President. Evening. Good evening, Mr. President. This is Dick Milliman, the candidate for Congress in Michigan's 3rd District. I'm speaking for myself and Congressman Jim Dunn of Michigan's 6th District. Sir, both Congressman Dunn and I agree that we can't cure our country's past economic problems as quickly as we all would like. But in Michigan, we are very hard hit by unemployment. Our question then is, what would you suggest we tell people in our districts who constantly ask us, what can be done now? to help our unemployment situation in Michigan. Dick, I know this may not sound like a satisfactory answer to a candidate who's got to go out and repeat it to the people, and yet it is the honest answer. To say, what can we do now? We're doing it. I would just remind them that when I was campaigning there in 1980, before there was an economic recovery program such as we have put in place in Washington uh, last year, there was in Flint, Michigan, when I campaigned there, they told me unemployment was 20 percent. They told me it was 18 percent in Detroit. And there were other places, the same kind of record. In other words, in the industrial states like Michigan, the unemployment had already started because that's when the interest rates were 21 and a half and people weren't buying automobiles on installment plans and they weren't building houses or buying them because they couldn't afford the mortgages at that kind of interest rate. And that's when inflation was 12.4 percent. Now, as I said last night, inflation caused the high interest rates, and between the two of them, they have caused the slowdown that has created that unemployment. Since that time, as I gave those figures earlier, and how far we have come down in interest rates and inflation, the next, the next to follow must be unemployment. But in all the recessions in the past, when they've had the quick fixes, uh, unemployment never came down under recovery as far as it had been before the recession. And there have been seven recessions before this one since World War II. I wish that I could say there was something that we could do instantly. What they did in the past, uh, in those other seven recessions, was of course artificial stimulants, uh, pump up the money supply, and then up went the inflation and up went the interest rates. And yes, there would be, because of uh, make-work programs, government-funded programs at many mil billions of dollars uh, that were temporary, that didn't lead to any uh, set job, and this would seemingly give an end to the recession. But as I say, it never went back down where it should, the unemployment, and the next recession was only about two years away. Now, we're trying to make it permanent. And I know that it, it will take some time for the unemployment to feel the effect of the reduced inflation and the reduced interest rates. But I believe it is the only way to ensure permanency. And I think if we remind the voters out there and remind those people who are unemployed, and no one can feel worse about that than a person like myself who was in the job market in the Great Depression of the 30s, but remind them that the unemployment started long before our economic recovery program, and nothing was being done about it that was permanent or lasting. And now these other figures are coming down, and I think unemployment is going to also. In the meantime, we have and are funding extensions of unemployment in the hard-hit states for those who have run out their time period for unemployment insurance. We have just recently passed a job training bill in which we're going to be training a million people a year for legitimate jobs, the kind of jobs that are available in your various communities. Mr. President, we move next to Mansfield, Ohio, which is the home of our good friend, Congressman Mike Oxley. Mike has the best of all worlds. Uh, he, because of his tremendous support for you and the outstanding individual, he has no opponent November 2nd, uh, so we're sure of having one good vote for us next year. 
Asking the question at, uh, in Mansfield is Dr. Bob Jones, who is a doctor of internal medicine, is married and has four children. Good supporter of yours. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening. My question this evening is this. What are your predictions for the election of ne November 1982? Well, doctor, um, uh, my prognosis is optimistic. Uh, I think that we've got good candidates out there. Uh, we have got good funds, and we have kept with a tradition that's been true for over a quarter of a century in the Republican Party. And that is that even though the Democrats continue to call us the party of the fat cats and the rich, the Republican Party, as it has for a quarter of a century, has raised the most of its money from small contributors, and far more from small contributors than our opponents have raised. And between these two things, the kind of candidates we have and people like yourself out there who have turned out at these affairs to be of help, I know that tradition also has it that in the first off-year election after a party gets the White House, there is a great loss uh, in the Congress. Well, I don't think there's going to be as great a loss as is traditional. I think we're going to do better uh, than the, uh, the tradition would have it. And we're going to get some of those fine new candidates, and we're going to get our incumbents back. Mr. President, I can only second those remarks. Uh, and we're moving to uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, to the home of the Tullahoma High School Auditorium, where many of her friends and supporters are there to honor Sissy Baker, who is a good friend of a good friend of yours, is your daughter of a good friend of yours, as you know, Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker. You bet. With, with Sissy's election on November 2nd, it'll be, she'll be the youngest member of Congress and it'll be the first daughter-father team that ever has served the United States Congress. I think it's time we set that new mark and I, had the, I agree. The, uh, Asking the question tonight uh, from Tennessee is Mr. Jess Hela, Hela, excuse me, Mr. Jess Held, who's president of Worth Sports, who's a longtime Republican, a good supporter of Senator Baker, yourself, and been very helpful with Sissy. All right. Good evening, Mr. President. Evening. I'm speaking from Tullahoma, Tennessee, with the Sissy Baker campaign. She would like you to say a hello to her father. She doesn't get to see much of him anymore. My question is, these elections seem to be drawing a lot of attention this year. Can you give us some specifics on why this 1982 election is so vital? Oh, I certainly can. There are any number of reasons and statistics as to why this is vital. First, before I answer, Sissy, I'll say hello to your father, and we're looking forward to when you and he will both be in the same city together. Now, why is it so vital? We have a Republican Senate, a majority. And when you get a majority, even by one vote, you name the chairman of the committees, and you have the majority of the committees. But the other house, the House of Representatives, the majority is of the opposition party. And the leadership of that party, to give you an example, the uh, amendment, the proposed amendment for, I believe it was, for uh, the constitutional amendment of, of balancing the budget, has been buried in committee over on that side of the House, in the, in the House side, for, uh, well, just about a year. It was in the committee and has been buried all this time, and then, it took 218 names in the House, some Democrat, I will say, joined us, to, by petition, get it out of the committee on the floor after it had been passed by more than a two-thirds majority in the Senate. Then, when it was voted on, a majority of the House voted for that amendment, but it wasn't a two-thirds majority, so it's failed and we have to start over again. What I'm getting at is that for almost solidly back over uh, through the Eisenhower years, we have had both houses of the legislature, the Congress, dominated by the Democratic Party, even when we had Republican presidents. The only Republican president who had a Democratic or a Republican Congress was one two-year period, Dwight Eisenhower. And in that two-year period, inflation was zero practically. Unemployment was down at two and a half percent, and all of the figures were that way. Now, when I stop to think of our own economic recovery program, 
and the compromises that we had to make to get it through the House. We had called for a 30 percent tax cut to be retroactive to January 1st, 1981. We only got 5 percent, and uh, it started in July 1st, not retroactive to January. And then 10 percent the next uh, uh, October, and we're getting 10 percent. I maybe have these dates wrong. No, I think it was the 5 percent October and the 10 percent in Ju July, and the next 10 percent will be in this next July. Um, but what I'm getting at is that we have a Republican executive branch now. We have a Republican Senate. We haven't really been given a fair chance at showing what we can do with that division there in the Congress. Isn't it fair to assume that after really almost 40 years of total domination, by a Democratic Congress, even when there was a Republican president. They are the ones, the Congress is the, they are the ones who pass the programs, they are the ones who uh, decide on the spending bills and so forth, and they are the ones who have built up a trillion dollar debt that we're paying $110 billion a year interest on. So I think that the, all of the facts point to if we have our policies supported in the Congress by a Republican majority, if we have Republican majorities in the committees so that the things that are proposed and are passed in committee come out to the floor so the, the representatives and the senators can vote on them, that's what we have to have. Mr. President, we move now to Indiana, which is the home of our good friends, Senators Dick Luger and Dan Quayle. And tonight there's a group uh, in Jeffersonville, Indiana, along the Ohio River who are honoring our outstanding candidate there, Floyd Coates. Floyd, who was a very strong supporter, worked for you in the last election, is running against incumbent Lee Hamilton. Asking the question is another good strong supporter of yours, George Hughes, who's president of E.H. Hughes and Company, who's also a strong supporter of the two senators there. George. Good evening, Mr. President. It would appear that many economic indicators are showing improvement. Can you provide any specifics for additional reduction in government spending and taxation? And what do you foresee as the role of the 98th Congress? The role of the 98th Congress, George, is to continue giving us support for our economic recovery program, which means making the additional reductions in spending. Now, in these two years, 81 and 82, uh, we have made about well, no, I'm, I'm off on my figures again. 82 in the coming budget resolution that's been passed for 83 will amount to about $50 billion reduction in the increases that have been scheduled. We've never reached a point in which we could actually cut a budget back to smaller than it was before, and that would be a dream come true. But as you know, when you submit a budget, you have to make proposals on out for about uh, three to five years ahead. And so when we came here and inherited in the uh, 1981 fiscal year, the budget already passed, we also inherited the projected budgets for uh, 82 and 83. We have reduced those projections by $50 billion. Now, the Congress has promised us with the combination tax and spending program that was passed this summer, they promised us $3 in cuts, spending cuts, for every dollar of increased revenue in that tax program over the next three years. That's about $380 billion of spending cuts. And we must hold them to that promise that over the next three years we're going to reduce the scheduled increases in government spending by those $380 billion. To get those deficits down and come to the day when we will have a balanced budget. Now, I don't foresee any tax increases as far as we're concerned uh, that we would introduce. I must remind you, however, the biggest tax increase that was ever passed in our history was passed in 1977, and it was a payroll increase in Social Security. And there are two more installments of that yet to come in 1985 and I believe in uh, 1990. And those uh, 
are scheduled and are in, in the law that was passed in 77 by the, under the previous administration. But we believe that our course now should be to continue the reductions in spending that we've started. Mr. President, we now move on to Wichita, Kansas, where we're a group there honoring Gerald Kaywood, our outstanding candidate who's running against incumbent Dan Glickman in the 4th Congressional District in Kansas. An old friend of yours, a Republican Eagle, uh, Willard Garvey, who's chairman of the board of Garvey Industries and founder of Homeowners Trust, which is a group dedicated to fighting political spending and waste in government, is going to ask you the question. Willard? Yeah, Mr. President, on the same question, government spending is still the root cause of inflation and unemployment. Congress has doubled spending in six years and now costs each family over $8,000 per year plus $10,000 per family for national debt plus $100,000 per family for unfunded federal liabilities. Just a 10% cut in spending would free up $80 billion, enough for 8 million new $10,000 jobs. And my question is, what do our candidates for Congress and the rest of us need to do that will help you to cut spending? What we need are more Republicans like Gerald K. Wood in Washington to help us against a leadership of the House which has never agreed with our program of cutting, which is still dedicated to the big spending by the federal government and the belief that the federal government and government programs are the answer to all our problems. And they can't see that over these past decades, uh, government is not the answer to the problems. Government is the problem. And so this election is all important from that standpoint. I have to be honest and say that we have had the support of some Democrats that I think rec uh, they represent the, the feeling of the rank and file Democrats, millions of them, who are out of step with this party leadership and who have uh, collaborated with us in getting the cuts that we've gotten so far and getting the tax cuts that we've gotten so far. As the economy improves, and as we begin to improve on the unemployment situation, you are going to see that we're going to do better at reducing those deficits also because every added one percentage point of, un of unemployment adds about $25 billion to the deficit. That is in lost revenue by the individual not working and in the benefits that must be paid out. So again, the economic recovery program is the best answer that we can have. I wish it were possible all at once to simply make a slash uh, in the spending. As I said in my opening remarks, we've removed, we reduced the increase from year to year in spending from 17% down to 6%. But to, to go beyond that, you can't do it all at once because you would be pulling the rug out from under people uh, without any warning or any provision for them. People who, through no fault of their own, have become dependent on some of the government programs. And I have pledged that while we're going to bring down the spending, we are going to preserve that safety net for those people who must depend on the rest of us for their livelihood. Mr. President, we move now out to the Northwest to Bellingham, Washington, where a group is out there honoring our outstanding candidate, State Representative Joan Houchin, who is running against incumbent Doug Swift. Bellingham, Washington is a logging and fishing area, and our questioner tonight is a 30-year-old linesman for a local power company, Mr. Sam Brown, not the other Sam Brown that we all knew so much about. This is Sam Brown, who's president of the County Young Republicans. Sam? Mr. President, we've all heard about your new federalism program. When do you expect this program to take place? And what benefits can we in Bellingham, Washington, expect once these programs are turned back to state and local government? Sam, some of the program, the federalism program, those things that we could do administratively, simply by executive order, some of those things have been done, such as putting uh, grants together that were once known as categorical grants. That meant that here was a specific program that the federal government helped in funding, but then the federal government insisted that the money had to be spent exactly the way the federal government regulations 
uh, called for it in his spending. And many times these were wasteful. Uh, they didn't recognize the fact that the priorities were different from city to city, county to county, or state to state. We have lumped many of those in what are called block grants, in which we've said here, this program, that program, the other program, here is a block of money, federal aid to you, and you can set the priorities in spending that money. Now what we need from the Congress, we need legislation on, is the part of the program that will allow us to transfer programs, the part of the programs now being run by the federal government that we believe could be better run at local and state level bureaucracy uh, to, for administration, that money will be freed up and it will mean that the programs will actually cost less for both. We expect to suggest that program if not, uh, well I don't think that it would be wise for us to put it up in the special session uh, that will come in November, but immediately after the first of the year with the 98th Congress, uh, we are going to present this program. We've been working on it in company with governors, with mayors, with city councilmen, with state legislators, county officials, uh, ironing out the wrinkles in it, and we'll be ready in January to present it. Mr. President, we're going to move back across the country. We're going to go to Manchester, New Hampshire, where Bob Smith, who is our outstanding candidate who's challenging incumbent Norm DeMores, uh, is being honored there by a group of citizens. Our guest uh, questioner is Lois Beaulieu, who was our town chairman in, in 1980, your town chairman in yes. New Market, New Hampshire. Well, Lois, hello. Hello, Mr. President. I understand there are about a dozen congressmen who are actually co-sponsors of the balanced budget constitutional amendment, but who deceived the public and voted against it anyway. I'm sorry to say my Congressman Norman DeMores was one of those flip-floppers. What can we do about this group of congressmen, and do you think there's a chance of passing a balanced budget amendment next year? We're going to be back asking for that balanced budget next year. Over 40 states have that in their state constitutions. My own state of California, when I was governor, it has that. Um, it works, and it's the only way we're really going to get control of spending is to have that, the people in the polls that show that 80% of them want it. And what we have to do, you say about those congressmen like your opponent who flip-flopped on things of that kind, forgive me, but may I say to all of you out there, I don't think that we pay enough attention to what goes on in Washington uh, while it's going on. And therefore, candidates can say one thing and then do another and vote another way and very often get away with it just simply because the people aren't aware. Don't let them get away with it. Keep track of how they're voting. And when they vote right, go out of your way to drop them a note and let them know they voted right. When they vote wrong, do what you should do in New Hampshire in this district right now. Vote for Lois Bellew for Congress. Mr. President, let's go back home to Sacramento, California, where they're honoring Roger Canfield, who was our candidate there against incumbent Vic Fazio. Roger was, worked for the Senate uh, out there in the state, uh, state uh, government and was the architect of a very good reapportionment plan. Unfortunately, there weren't enough votes in the legislature, and Phil Burton got his plan through. But hopefully the district that Roger's running in is, is not so badly drawn that, uh, that he can't win in, in November. Roger will ask you the question himself, Mr. President. Roger? Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. President, this is uh, Roger Canfield, suburban Sacramento. And uh, we're concerned out here with uh, what government can do about crime, cons considering uh, that's the purpose of government, protect our life and property. And I'm running against a guy out here who's against the death penalty and uh, voted for reduced penalties for rape. Roger, uh, they're going to think this is a frame-up. I just went over to the Justice Department this morning and made a speech in an auditorium to a, an assembled audience there, many of them having to do with law enforcement, and announced an eight-point crime program. Now I recognize that the federal government can only do so much uh, in that because most of our criminal statutes are state statutes and therefore uh, it is local law enforcement. and. 
uh, the local and state government that has to do with that. But our eight-point crime program is aimed at organized crime. Uh, we have had a tremendous success with a brand new kind of task force in South Florida where about 80% of the drugs that were coming in uh, from the other countries were coming in through South Florida. And our task force lined up local and state government and our federal forces, uh, even up to and including military, uh, giving us tracking of boats and uh, planes that were bringing in drugs. And we literally have stopped it cold there. Now, of course, the drug runners are seeking out other entry points in the country. So part of our program this morning called for 12 such task forces nationwide to go after this, as well as the program against organized crime. Uh, I won't go into all the eight points. Time doesn't permit. But you are going to see the federal government uh, doing more in this whole field of crime, including the fact that we are making a training institution here that has been for federal officers and FBI and Secret Service and so forth, this is going to now be made available to local law enforcement officers so that we can have better cooperation. And uh, I think we're going to make a difference. Well, Mr. President, I know how difficult it is for both of us to leave Sacramento, but we'll have to go to Longview, Texas next. And there we're going to visit with Pete Collum. And Pete, uh, who worked for our former, fr our great friend, uh, John Tower. Uh, Pete is running against Ralph Hall. And maybe you remember, but Pete's daughter, Alexandria, was co-chairman of Tots for Reagan in 1980 uh, with your grandson, Cameron. Alexandria yes. is three years old, and she's there tonight. <laughs> well, Alexandra, hello, and hello, Bart. Asking the question tonight is Bob Cargill, uh, who's involved in the oil industry there, which is very, very important, as, as we all know, in Texas. Bob? Uh, Mr. President, this is not Bob Cargill. This is Bart Owens from Greg County, Texas. The question, particularly for the independent producers, is do you still plan to eliminate the Department of Energy? Yes, we do. Uh, we are proceeding on that course. It isn't easy. I know that it sounds to the average person as if, well, why can't you just say it's out of business and it's out of business? You have to remember that when a department like that, a cabinet department, was formed, it didn't start from scratch. There were a number of programs already in place in other agencies of the government that are essential programs that the federal government should be maintaining, and they were lumped together in this new department. So part of the engineering is the redistribution of these programs back to the other agencies where they were. And, of course, part of it again is hostility on the part of our opponents in the House uh, against uh, eliminating this department. But uh, we think that, that it's the right thing to do. Uh, we think that we've made some, some good progress there in uh, Things like the decontrol. I remember our opponents said that gasoline was going to cost $2 a gallon if we did it. Well, today, we're about 91% uh, self-sufficient in this, and it isn't costing $2 a gallon. It's costing less than it did under controls and all. So we're going to keep on going until we get that department eliminated. Mr. President, that concludes our quick visit around the country. Many of these outstanding candidates and incumbents and their tremendous supporters I know have been supporters of yours over the years, and we look forward to having them all back here to work with in January 1982. Well, Ed, we'll keep at it there, and thank you very much for helping. In closing, I just want to say how essential all of you are to our cause. It's an old truth, but every vote does count, and the results of this election will hinge perhaps more than anything else on voter turnout. The basic job of identifying supporters and getting them to the polls is still one of the most important in politics. Technology like we're enjoying tonight can't replace the hard work of getting out the vote. As I've said, I believe we're going to do well. We've got fine candidates, a wide base of contributors, an efficient party organization, and we've got good issues. Issues the people of this nation truly care about. It's up to you Republicans at the grassroots to make sure that the voters understand how important the choice is this year. The choice between going back to old policies that didn't work or going ahead in the new direction we've set. 
We're on a new road now, a road that's leading America to better times. Unless we have the courage to stay on course and defeat our economic problems now, we'll never have lasting recovery and our problems will grow worse than before. Well, I intend to stay the course and we're going to succeed, but we need your support. So please, promise me that you'll mobilize and get out the vote for a great Republican victory on November 2nd. As I said last night, it isn't an easy job, this challenge to rebuild America and renew the American dream, but we can do it. Throughout our history, we Americans have proven again and again that no challenge is too big for a free, united people. Together we can do it again, and we can start making those dreams come true by electing Republican candidates to office. We couldn't have done what we have without our majority in the Senate. Think what we can do with more Republicans in the House. Thank you again, and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the live portion of our broadcast. The film which follows chronicles the president's first year in office and is narrated by Charlton Heston. The title of the film is The Legacy of Greatness.